kind of chronologically uh, in Luke now. If I can get going here. There we go. And there are a lot of kingdom parables uh, as we get into this. Um, things Jesus uses to parallel to the kingdom. Um, this is one of those cases where they're picking out these places of honor at the table. And, you know, I think in that culture, of course, in any culture, in any time, there's a, uh, there's a uh, places you would rather set, I think. And I think in those times, with the guy, those lead be at the head of the table, and then, of course, those closest to him would be in the most place of honor. Those on his right, especially, those closest to the head of the table. Those were seats of honor at the table. And he says, when you're invited, he says, uh, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited. And so give up this place. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. You know, so this is one of these cases where they show up and they're like, well, I'm going to set up here at the front, right? Set close, set the place of honor. But then someone comes along that's more distinguished than they are, maybe a higher title or higher rank, and they say, you know, you're in my seat, right? So you need to give that up. You need to move back. And in this case, he says, they're going to move back to the last place, not just going to move down a chair, right? But in this case, they're going to move back to the very last place. Um, so he says, go and recline at the last place. So that when the one who's been invited comes, he may say, move up higher, and you will have honor. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be, ex will be exalted. You know, what is that? That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it, for him to call you up to that place? What do you think Jesus is really talking about here? Well, obviously, we're not talking about going to dinner, Right? So what's Jesus really talking about here? What's he, what's he want us to see? What's he want them to see? Those that he's talking to. What does he want to, uh, what does he want to, want us to see here, do you think? To be humble, right? Number one, not to exalt ourselves, not to place ourselves above others. I think that's an important lesson in Christianity. He tells us always to honor others above ourselves. And I think that's an important, um, I think that's an important idea. When you, uh, what else do you think he's saying to those that are here? Who's he talking to here? Jews, right? Jews here? What do you think that has to do with the Jews? And what do you think they thought? What position of the table do you think the Jews thought they needed to set at? The back or the front? Jews thought they were chosen, right? They thought they were God's people. I mean, so when they come in, they're thinking, we're going to sit right here. We're going to sit right at the front because we're God's people. We're the Jews, right? We're chosen of God. Yeah, that's a really good point, you know, because they wanted the chief places. Jesus accused them of that, didn't he? You want the good seats. You want the places of honor. You want that exaltation, right? And Jesus accused them of that. He doesn't want them to be those kind of leaders. He doesn't want that hierarchy of religion, of faith. Um, and yet in the world, we still have a lot of that, don't we? Uh, exalting those who are in authority or putting robes upon them or putting them in a higher position. Um, Jesus was very humble himself, was he not? I mean, he didn't ever put on a show, right? He never, he never um, was one to look for a place of honor or a seat of distinguish. He, uh, Jesus was one who wanted to be judged not by who he said he was, but by what he did over and over. Isn't that what he wanted? Who do you say that I am, right? In other words, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to push myself up. I want my position of honor to be because uh, you give that to me, not because I take it. A lot of lessons in this. I think the Jews, 
would have wanted that place of honor. The Gentiles, to me, might be the ones that are coming in that Jesus says, you can have this seat, right? Where maybe the Jews thought they should sit. And then they would go to the last. The idea of humbling ourselves before God is, and not just before God, and I think that's a good point Bill brings up. It's not just humbling ourselves before God. It's humbling ourselves before each other, not just before God. Um, Jesus expects us to do that. And I think it's something that he taught us. Um, he went on to say the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers <coughs> or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they might also invite you in return, and that should be a repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Why would he say that? I mean, it looks to me like if I was going to give a reception, I'd want to invite people I knew, right? My friends and my relatives, my neighbors. But yet Jesus says here, he says, don't do that because they might invite you again. And in that case, you would have your repayment, right? He says, but invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. But for a Jew, that's a double hit because the Jews thought they were cursed of God, unclean anyway, to invite them to dinner. That wouldn't really be something that you wanted to do, would it? But yet Jesus here says, invite those people. Um, what's the bigger picture? We're not just talking. This is a kingdom parable. You have to put this in terms of the kingdom of God, of us, right? So what does that mean uh, when he says that, do you think, to invite the ones who can't repay you? Um, what does that mean to us, to me and you, in the kingdom, in God's kingdom? Who should we invite to... Uh, Right, they're more receptive. We shouldn't expect a repayment in this earth. I think that's a mistake we make. We make it in the church too. I was in Ashton a long time ago, years ago, and there was a family who was living in a car, literally. It's like six people living in a car, and uh, it was winter, and I know they come to the church, and there was a lot of discussion about what to do. And so we actually let them live in the church building for about two weeks. Um, and then we got them an apartment, you know, to live in. Kind of got them set up. And then, uh, but then they never come to church after that. And a lot of people really got upset about that, you know. Uh, we did all this, like, they ought to be here. And I'm like, why do you think like that? You know, you can't buy somebody's faith, right? I mean, you can't buy their faithfulness. You can't buy their wanting to be here. You do the right thing. Sometimes you don't get a repayment here, but that doesn't mean there's not a repayment. That doesn't mean God doesn't expect us to do it. You know, you can't always look. And I think you see that as Gary could tell you and as I could tell you and others who have been involved in the food bank over the years, you know, we do a lot, give a lot of food out, help a lot of people. Great thing, great ministry. But you don't, anybody, anybody you talk to, any church you talk to that has a food bank, are gonna, they're going to tell you one thing. You're not, that's not, it's not a, you're not going to gain much numbers spiritually from those people. Every, every church, that's one thing when we first started doing this years ago, and Jackie Smart did it years ago, went and talked to several congregations, and he said, you know, he says, if you're doing this to gain people, to get people to come to church, you're going to be disappointed. It's not going to happen. And he's right. They were right. The funny thing to me about the food bank over the years, if I can share this, Gary probably would back me up. The funny thing is we haven't gained people that we've helped with food, but we've gained a lot of people here that come and helped with the food bank. And that's really been the fascinating part of that to me. It's people that have come and volunteered to help and then wind up coming to church because they get a relationship with the people who are working the food bank. And, and that's built a relationship. And that's, that, that to me has been a real plus over the years, I think. 
with the food bank, more maybe than the people we help because realistically that never has really, and it won't because they're not here for, to find a place to go to church, are they? They're not coming to the food bank to, to get spiritually nourished. They're coming to the food bank to get a bag of food. And the reality is if you were doing that here or doing that at the Civic Center or doing that out of a van on Main Street, you could accomplish that goal, couldn't you? But the truth is, is that we're told to do it. We're told to feed those, help those who need it. It's something we're commanded to do. And the Bible doesn't say do it because they're going to come be part of you. The Bible says do it because they're cold and they're hungry and because they need food. And so we don't look for repayment that way, and we shouldn't. And if we wind up gaining something that way, then praise God. But if we don't, we still can't look at it like we're doing something for you. You need to do something for us. God doesn't work that way. And we don't need to work that way in our minds. And yet we do because we're human and because that's how we think, isn't it? Um, it's kind of a weird thing. I was thinking of this passage uh, where he says you've got your repayment. My kids have got to a point with Christmas that they don't know what to get each other anymore, you know. And so they uh, started giving each other these gift cards for Christmas, right? So it's kind of funny because one of them would give them a gift card and the other one would give them a gift card back, right? And so I'm thinking, this really doesn't make any sense. So if they finally come to the conclusion, they just don't get themselves Christmas presents anymore because they were just swapping gift cards, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, it's kind of a, I don't know, I'm just thinking about that. It says, you'll be blessed since they don't have the means to repay you, and you'll be repaid at the resurrection. So God says there's a repayment. It's just not here, not now, not in this second. He says, those reclining at the table with him heard this. He said to them, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. What an amazing statement, he says, because the kingdom is coming. The kingdom's here. He says, the kingdom's among us. And so basically, he's saying, you're, you're going to be blessed because those you sitting here are going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Um, and I, th I think it's an interesting statement that Jesus, uh, that Jesus makes. Any comments about that before we move on? He, uh, he says, a man was given a big dinner and he invited many. He sent a slave to say those who were invited, come for everything is ready. And they all like began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land. I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please consider me accused. excused. Another one said, I married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. He became angry. So who's the invited guest here in this parable? Huh? The Jews, yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the ones, the Jews are invited. They're God's chosen. They're God's people. I mean, they're the ones that are invited. But he says they're making excuses, right? Um, I've done this. I've done that. I can't come. Um, and I think if you look at that, the Jews, maybe in the last day, or maybe as Jesus sees them, be making excuses why they didn't follow Christ, why they didn't come to, this is the dinner, the feast, the kingdom that he's talking about. Bless those who eat bread in the kingdom of God, he just said. And then he goes right into this parable. I've got this feast, this dinner, right? Um, you didn't come. You made excuses. So he says, I'll send my slave out into the streets and lanes and I'll bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Who are those? The poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Those are the unclean, right? Uh, that would be us, the Gentiles. And he says there's still room. And he says uh, the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges. Compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste of my dinner. He just said, bless are you who eat bread in the kingdom of God. Remember that right before he went into this. And now he's saying, you're not going to eat 
in my at my dinner you see you see what he's saying so the jew here he's saying if you don't accept me if you don't come to me if you reject my invitation am i right who's the who is the who's the if you go back in this a little bit who is the uh who's the man giving the dinner and who do you think is the slave that went out to invite everybody in this in this story Who's the man that's giving the dinner? God. Who's the slave that went out? Jesus. Right? They didn't listen to him. Said, well, we don't believe you're the son of God. We don't believe this is the Messiah we're looking for. Right? They made excuses. He just said, lest you eat bread in the kingdom. Well, they're not going to eat bread in the kingdom. So then he goes out and gets the lame and the blind and the crippled, which to the Jew is the unclean. The Gentile is the unclean too. Jesus didn't say Gentile, but that's what he's talking about. The Greek, the Gentile, the Roman. So he goes out, he says, invite them in. And then he says, oh, but there's still room. So what does that have to do with it? He says there's still room. So he says, go out into the highways and along the hedges compel them to come in so why does he say that so now he said the jews that reject him that don't take the invitation aren't going to get to eat the gentiles are going to be invited to come in right and there's still going to be room that's kind of interesting isn't it a lot of room in the kingdom right so he says now go out into all these into the hedges and the highways and compel them to come in so why does he say that now Yeah, he said, go get the blind, the lame, and the crippled. There's still room. He says, now go get whoever you can get. Whoever will accept the invitation can eat at this table, you see. Whoever will accept. So he opens it up to everybody. He says, I'm opening it up to everybody. Whoever you can get to come, have them come. And that's what the kingdom is. That's a kingdom parable. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, whoever you can get to come, they're welcome to come, to sit at this table and to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Because that's really what we're talking about here is the kingdom of God. And it really fits in with what Jesus says. Blessed to you who will eat in the kingdom. These large crowds that are following him. Why? Why are they following him? Working miracles, right? You know, when I read these stories of Jesus, I always think of those old Western stories, Western movies I used to watch when I was a kid, where the guy come in town, the snake oil salesman. Remember those shows? And he would gather up a crowd, wouldn't he? Whatever it took, he'd get a crowd. He would come to see what he could do, right? Well, that's what's happening with Jesus. He's, a, you know, he's not a snake oil salesman because he's selling the real thing. But people are gathering up to see what he'll do. What miracle will you do next? Who will you heal? Maybe they needed to be healed. The point is, Jesus got aggravated with those people somewhat, I think. I don't think you can see that. Well, maybe you can if you read between the lines a little bit. But if you put yourself in the place of Jesus, don't you think that Jesus wanted them to come to him because of who he was, not what he could do? I mean, don't you really think that? Jesus wanted them to say, well, you're the son of God. He wanted them to know who he was. But they didn't follow him because of who he was. They followed him because of what he could do. If you read John 6, which I know we're not in John, because we're in synoptics. But man, what a powerful passage is John 6, where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh, taste my blood, you have no part in me. He says, you follow me not because you saw the signs and the wonders, because you ate the loaves and were filled. John 6, 66, he says, many of them withdrew. We're not following anymore. That's when he looked at the rest of the apostles, and he says, would you go away also? 
And Peter says, to whom shall we go, Lord? We know that come, we've come to know and believe that you have the words of eternal life. Right? Isn't that what Jesus wanted him to know? Isn't that what he still wants us to know? People follow Jesus for a lot of reasons today. A lot of reasons. I know it does. You don't think of it this way. Because Jesus isn't there. Jesus isn't here performing miracles. But people still follow Jesus for a lot of different reasons today. A lot of it's maybe what they think he can do for them, right? Maybe their needs or their grief or their pain or their sickness. And that's okay. I mean, Jesus said to pray for those things, to ask for those things. But if that's the reason you're following Jesus, it's the wrong reason. You know? God blesses us because, why? Because, what did he say? What did Jesus tell us in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, seek ye first the what? Kingdom. And all these things will be added unto you. You see, it's priority, isn't it? It's God blessing us, Jesus blessing us because of our relationship with him. But our relationship with him Think about this with me. Are there people in your life, do you have anybody in your life that's, um, how can I say this tactfully? English is my first language. I'm just struggling for the word. Do you have anybody in your, can I say a leech? Is that, can I say that? Does that make any sense? Do you have anybody in your life that always wants something from you? That when you, the phone rings, you know it's because they want something. You have people in your life like that. You know, those people, we have a different relationship with those people, don't we, than we do with people who, we have a good relationship, people who call us just to see how we're doing, and we got a relationship with them, and then they, maybe they want something, but it doesn't seem like it's an imposition, really, does it? Because they're your friend, you know? They're, you have a relationship, so it's like, sure, you know, come get it. Um, but the people who always want something, do you ever wonder, do they really like you for you? Or do they like you because you got something they want to borrow all the time, right? You know, you know, why do they really, why do they really like you? Why do they have a relationship with you? Is there a relationship based on who you are or on what you have that they need? Well, I think Jesus wanted them to have a relationship and still does with us because of who he is, not because of what he can do. I think what he can do is secondary to who he is in our life it should be don't you i mean primarily we should be wanting a relationship with god because that gets us eternity in heaven that's our primary goal should be our primary goal everything else is a secondary goal to ask him for our needs our wants our health our desires which is fine and he wants us to do that but don't you think jesus god is kind of like Maybe we're kind of like that friend that always calls just wanting something from him and not ever the person who just wants to sit down and have a cup of coffee with him and ask him how his day's going and spend a little time with him. You know, I think Jesus wants us to be the guy that wants to spend a little time with him. And then if we need something, I don't think it's a big deal to him. But I think if we neglect our relationship, if we make it one-sided, if it's always about what we want, then I think we're following Jesus for the wrong reason. Maybe in the wrong way. Maybe not the wrong reason. Maybe I should be careful with that. Maybe where our relationship is wrong is not what it should be. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell these people here. He says, if you think following me is just going to make your life easy, and I'm going to, and it's, going to give you everything you want and it's all going to be easy then you need to rethink our relationship here because to have a relationship with me requires a sacrifice 
of something else. Relationships, true relationships are that way. Any true relationship you have in your life, whether it be with your wife or your children, or even the relationship you have with your job, right? Sometimes can be the same way. Relationships require a sacrifice, don't they? We give up something to have that relationship, a real relationship. If we don't, it's not really a real relationship, is it? Probably won't last very long. Even in a marriage, we always say it's give and take. Well, it should be more give than take if your marriage is going to really last because it's about thinking of the other person, um, doing what they love to do, not just what you love to do, um, being involved. And that requires you taking that away from someplace else. You only have so much time in your life, all of us do, so many hours in a day, so much time in a day. And anything that we do in our day, if you think about it, anything you do in your day takes away from something else you could do. Is that, is that right? In your day. So that's how relationships are. So the more involved we are in relationship, the more we take it from something else. Isn't that what destroys other relationships? Can relationships destroy other relationships? Absolutely. They do it all the time in our life, don't they? You know, even a relationship with a, an addiction is essentially a relationship. You just have a relationship with something you're addicted to. And when you do that, you take it away from something else, don't you? And eventually the other relationships in your life, if you're so devoted to one thing, the other relationships in your life wither and die. You know, I had some good friends in high school. Spent a lot of time with them in high school. I got married right out of high school. And you know, I've never maintained those friendships because when I got married and my relationship became with my wife, those other relationships in my life slid away. I don't have those anymore because I took away from them to have the relationship I have with my wife. So those relationships dwindled away. With God, he's saying the same thing here. When you have a relationship with me, other relationships in your life are going to pay a sacrifice. It's just how it is. Just inevitable. But here he says, if you don't hate, and that's probably not the best translation or best idea. It doesn't mean that we have to hate them. It doesn't mean that we have, well, if I'm going to follow God, I'm going to hate my mother. It's not what he's saying, okay? That's not at all what he's saying. So what's he saying here? What does he mean when he says, you must hate your own father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can my, not be my disciple. So what does he mean by that, do you think? Huh? Love less. Yeah. Yeah, love less is the best translation. You got to, you have to understand that. So that's difficult, right? In other words, these are the most important. Jesus picks the closest relationships in our life to illustrate this point. He doesn't, and that's our mother and our father and our wife and our children, our brothers and our sisters. The closest relationships we have within our life. Those are the closest relationships we have. But he says those relationships, you have to love them less than you love me um, in order to be my disciple. And, you know, I've seen that illustrated in the lives of so many people. Um, and I think that it's maybe we don't fully appreciate what this means to certain people. I, I did this, um, I did this World Bible School, these students online, if you've ever done that, super cool. You ought to do it. If you, if you got a computer and you got 15 minutes a day, seriously, get on WBS, get you a student. Most of the time they only make it through one lesson anyway. I've only had one make it all the way, but she was kind of an inspiration to me because she was lived in South Africa. You get to pick whoever if you get on there, anywhere in the world. You pick whatever student you want. There's people in the United States too. Um, I've had several students in Branson, Missouri, as a matter of fact. None of them ever made it past the first lesson, but, you know, you do their lesson and then they do another. It's, it's a lot of fun. And anyway, um, I did have this one girl, lady, 
that actually went all the way through to the very end, which is pretty impressive. And uh, she lived in South Africa. And, of course, you don't really get to know the people because it's pretty, um, you know, they pretty well protect you from, like, like you don't know their email. They don't know your email. You communicate through the site, so there's not, like, interaction. But, but anyway, um, as I have got to know her through that, uh, found out her family, her whole family was uh, involved in witchcraft, um, voodoo, uh, actually. And she had explained to me the struggles she had with, uh, her, with her parents and her family because she actually was baptized into Christ. And it, was, uh, and it was really amazing to see how she had to put her family aside in order to follow Christ. And I thought about her. Matter of fact, I shared this passage with her on the, on the site because I thought it was really one of those cases where she really had to deny her family in order to and she actually got pulled back into that for a while, and for two or three months, I didn't get anything from her. And then all of a sudden, she popped back up, and, and she explained to me that her family had caused her problems, and she'd had difficulties, and, and that now she was back. And, and I always think of her when I think of this passage, um, because she loved God more. And I think that's what we have to do. Cross-caring is something I've looked at a lot. Those of you who know me, you know that's kind of one of my things. I've I think it's fascinating what Jesus says here. I think uh, I didn't understand it for a long time. And, but I think it's, uh, it's our cross here. And for a long time, I never understood that. Um, I don't carry the cross of Christ. Um, I carry my own cross, and you carry your cross. And I think trying to find out what that cross is is, I've heard a lot of thoughts on that, you know. Well, it's self-denial, which in this passage, yeah, probably that might have makes sense. It's self-denial. It's um, uh, forgiveness. I've heard that. The cross is, is forgiveness, maybe, maybe. Um, but I know there's some things you can deduce from the passage. One is, is like I said, it's your cross, it's not someone else's, and nobody else can carry it for you. Do you agree with that? Nobody else can carry it for you. And the other thing I think that's really interesting, if you kind of put everything we've been talking about and you get down to this point in this passage, because this is one discourse, um, is that I don't think you can carry a cross and not know it's there. I think if I think if you I think if you're a disciple of Christ, truly a disciple of Christ, you have to feel a weight of faith, of Christianity, of God. I don't think you can carry a cross and not know you're carrying it. I think people who are Christians or profess to be Christians and don't feel the weight of the cross, of their cross, I would question their faith. Because I think it, that's what it is. It's something you feel, the weight of the cross. Jesus carried the cross up Calvary. The weight of the cross was too much, right? And so Joseph of Arimathea, and so Joseph was called in to help him, right? Carry the cross, carry the weight of the beam. Um... I think there's a lot to this. Jesus looking towards his own death, maybe, looking towards. The cross was common in that culture, so it was something that meant something to them. I think it's a fascinating idea what he tells them. Count the cost. You know, we don't tell people that, do we? We very, and I, th I think we mess up with people. When we try to convert them to Christianity, convert them to Christ, do you ever, when you're converting someone to Jesus, do you ever say, count the cost? Do we ever say that? Count the cost of discipleship, the commitment. Because when you decide to follow Jesus, if you really follow him, you'll pay a cost in your life. There's a price to be paid for being a disciple of Jesus. And 
I think the reward far outweighs the cost. Don't get me wrong. But to say there's not a cost, yeah. You could be home eating eggs on the porch. I might want to eat on the porch this morning, but you could be sitting in front of your fire eating eggs this morning and having a cup of coffee and scrolling through Facebook or something, right? But you're here. There's a cost. Um, there's a financial cost to being a Christian, right? Isn't there? Um, there's a financial burden to being a Christian. Sure there is. Even if you're not a big, necessarily what you put in the plate, there's a cost to being a Christian. Some people have to change their jobs or you can't work you can't because you're at church or you got to go to worship. But there's other things you have to do. There's a cost to coming back and forth to worship. There's a cost to going out to eat when you're done with worship, right? Because you got to do that. It's like Regulations chapter 4, right? you got to go out to eat after worship. So there's a cost to that, right? So there is a cost for Christianity, and not just that, but there's a spiritual cost for Christianity, sometimes a physical cost with your family or relationships around you that don't agree with your faith. Sometimes there can be a price to pay at work for coworkers who, who don't agree with you or don't agree with your faith. Um, there's prices to be paid for faith, and God understands that, and it's your cross. It's not mine, and it has to be yours. And there's a cost to be paid if you don't count the cost you can't finish the tower of course we're not talking about a tower right if you can't don't count the cost you can't finish you can't get to heaven you won't make it because you're not willing to, to pay the price that it takes to finish is there something we need to finish here sure sure there is we need to finish this life be faithful be true to god if we don't finish we won't make it a lot of people start, right? But not everybody finishes. I got a lot of them projects in my life, but I hope my faith isn't one of those. I'm all right with dying with a lot of things in my life not done. Matter of fact, I'm kind of looking forward to that, to be 100% honest about it. Kind of want to leave a mess for my children to have to clean up. It's just kind of my thing, right? So, I mean, I've been trying to prepare them, but, you know, but, uh, but I'm all right with leaving stuff undone here. I really am, but I don't want anything undone up there. I want to finish this, and I think that's what Jesus is saying. Count the cost. Be able to finish what you start, and when we convert people to Christ, when you're talking to people about being a Christian, don't sugarcoat the whole thing because that's a mistake, isn't it? Because we're not being real with what faith is, with what Christianity is. There's things you're going to have to change in your life if you're really going to be a Christian. There's things you're going to have to change in your relationships. There's things you're going to have to change with your time. There's things you're going to have to change with maybe your language or your attitude or how you treat other people or maybe your marriage, maybe your relationship with your kids. Things are going to change when you follow Christ. Are you ready to pay the price to get the reward? I think that's a great conversation we should have with people because unfortunately when we convert people uh, with cotton candy, um, they don't last very long, do they? Because they think it's all fluff and it's all wonderful. And they find out, you know what? There's really a cost to being a follower of Jesus. I like to think, as we're out of time, I like to think we need to give people real faith, not, uh, not fake faith, not prosperity and wealth and happiness and everything's going to be all right. I think we need to convert people to really what Jesus is, and we need to make real Christians with real faith, faith that endures. Um, I think if we do that, then we're able to keep people faithful to the Lord and able to let them finish the race. But they need to count the cost for faith. We all have to do that at times and decide if we're willing to pay it because the reward, the reward is great if we can finish are there any comments before we finish? Thanks for your time this morning.